Oh, welcome to tonight's very, very, very special presentation. Uh, and the Monday Night Masterclass. Tonight we have followed up a series of amazing international presenters that are at the absolute top of their game in their respective field. And tonight isn't any different. Tonight we have Kirik Ashley, who, for those of you who don't know Kirik, he's someone that's had a tremendous effect on my life. And one of the reasons why I've been getting the speakers on, if you didn't know, was because I'm finding people that have influenced me through tough times and have helped me get better so that you guys can share what I've had the experience of getting. So you guys can like get through the, the, the tough times that may or may not be happening now. <laughs> so Kirk Ashley is not only an uh, international best-selling author of the book, How Would Love Respond, but he, and he's way, way, way more than a motivational speaker. In fact, he's probably going to chip me for it, for saying that. Uh, he's a renowned as the transformer because he's, he's got this astounding ability to transform people's lives forever. It doesn't matter whether it's their business, their relationship, you know, even if they've got an illness, I've seen amazing things happen uh, right in front of my eyes for people that have, that have come in contact with Kurik. And that's why it's so special tonight. You know, he's recognized as one of the best world leading success coaches and a premier expert uh, in professional and personal development self-discovery, spiritual growth, and peak performance. He's taken people to gold medals in the Olympics, guys. <laughs> so he's transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, and he's going he's gonna to do it for you guys tonight. I, I'm that confident. So thank you very much, Krug, for being on, and congratulations, guys, for being on. And it's over to you, mate. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, wow, it sounds like I wrote that myself. That was so good. Uh, so let's open it up to that first question because this may dictate where we're going to go tonight. Uh, you never know. And um, who was who that person? It was uh, Yasmin, actually. So Yasmin. Unmute her. When I can find her. Correct me, she has the first question. Please wave <laughs> wherever you've gone. <laughs> there we go. Hi. Hello. I can't disappoint. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, my question is, if you were to build, expand a business in another country, how would you do so in an authentic way? And more specifically in like a network, like a networking kind of perspective? Yes, yes. Actually, it's a great question because I, I work all over the world and the thing is that you know people are people um the core of what makes us who we are is all the same so um you know like uh, when i was over in kuwait you know because of what you know, heard the news through desert storm in the middle east and you know muslims and arabs and yada 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 you know and you get over there and you find out that um uh, they're very loving people the service is Top notch, they have even they called Arab hospitality, which is some of the best service anywhere I've ever had, including the kebab stands and whatever. It's just part of their culture. Um, you know, that they want their kids to grow up to be better than they are. Um, you know, they, they family and love and laughter and smiles are the same everywhere in the world and sadness and death and mourning is everywhere in the world. So that part's the same. And yet the cultural part that makes us different, I find is what makes us interesting. But um, you know, one of the keys to, to doing business with anybody is always building and nurturing relationships, right? Which is, is life itself, but in business it's critical because, well, these days more than ever, you have more people coming at you trying to do business, trying to do network marketing, trying to um, sell you some kind of program or whatever that is but there's still people succeeding and there's a majority of people who are failing. The majority of people who are failing. Uh, like I get this on LinkedIn all the time in which somebody friends you as LinkedIn, you know, or connection, I guess what it is. And two seconds later, you know, they're trying to pitch their business to you with not knowing who you are, what you do, including things like, Oh, you know, I, I came across um, your, your profile on LinkedIn. I thought it was fantastic. Blah, blah, blah. So tell me what you do. I, uh, 
obviously did not read my bio, you know, did, did not do any homework on me. So wherever I am in the world, one of the things I do is I, I immerse myself in the culture even before I get there. So I learn about the people. And then certainly when I get there and even on the plane going there, you know, and I, I start learning about um, some of their unique cultural things and some of the language and whatever that is. So that like when I was in Kuwait, I got on stage and, and I said, hello, how are you or whatever in, in Arabic, you know, first I totally screwed it up and nobody knew what the hell I said, but um, they, they loved that I made the effort. Um, in the Philippines, I ate balut, which is a, a duck egg very close to hatching. It's, it's, um, when Filipinos ask me about it, they go, did you like it? I go, no, it was nasty. And they go, yeah, I don't like it either, but it is a delicacy there. So whenever I meet a Filipino person, I can just say I've eaten balut and it literally stops them in their track and they look at you for a moment. But only somebody who would really know their culture would, would be able to say that because it's unique, you know, it's something you know, very part of the culture. And uh, when I used to speak at the Publicity Summit in New York, because you'll see this is the same kind of example, um, the, uh, you're in front of 100 of the top TV and radio producers for all the talk shows, and you get two and a half minutes to pitch to, pitch to each one of them individually. Um, and, but before they get on, you know, before you go to the, um, the pitch sessions, there's like uh, three or four days of that, um, Every time Steve Harrison, who owns the program, uh, interviews the panel of producers and stuff, says, you know, what, what can you uh, tell these people about how to do a proper pitch and how to get noticed? And they all say, watch the show or listen to the show. See, there it is. It's about, you know, knowing who you're talking to so you know how to talk to them. Because um, we don't all want the same thing. We're not all the same, you know, so the cultural part of us is different and then within the culture itself um you know so just in, so you know i mean all filipinos aren't just one type of person so i would be first thinking about what kind of filipino people am i going to be talking to and if they're going to be business leaders well i might talk to those people differently than single parents um you know who are who have uh, troubled kids is an example so the more you know about the person or the people, the, and I mean detailed, as detailed as you can get, well then you know how to talk with them and certainly how to communicate with them because the quality of our life is always determined by the quality of our communication. And so um, uh, by, by doing, now I'll give you an example of this for everybody on a call. Have you ever noticed that whoever you get put in front of, you know, as soon as you learn a little bit about the person, you just seem to kind of make the adjustment to know how to talk with that person, you know, like you instantly know how to, you know, create connection. Well, that's because you get some, some gist of the person, you get some of the feel for the person. And so the, uh, I'll, I'll do this as a drawing because this is uh, so valuable. Pardon my uh, old school way of teaching, but oh well, that's life. By the way, Paper and pen have nailed, never failed me, but PowerPoint has. So, um, so this is called the curve, right? Now, um, in jo Joseph Campbell's book about the hero's journey, you know, this is the curve. And so every great story, every great fable, every great movie will have this curve in it. But also every great sales will have this curve in it. By the way, when I teach this to people, especially salespeople, um, they go, man, after you, I can't even watch a movie again the same way. If it doesn't have that curve, I hate the movie. You probably did anyways, actually. But here we find, I'm going to do this about the movie first, okay? Here we find out about the main character, right? Um, and then, you know, we take, they take us on this journey of discovery who they are. And then what happens is um, there's some kind of challenge that happens and they have to deal with the challenge. And then through that, they become our hero or leading person because they get themselves out of that challenge. And so that's the hero's journey. And by the way, if the movie or story doesn't have this, it, it pretty much sucks anyways. In sales, here, right here at the beginning, by the way, um, this is one of the things I worked with Joel on in the very beginning is that, right, see, most people think that um, here is where you do the close. But actually, it's here. 
this is where you do the close is at the beginning, not the end. It's only called the close is because you're closing it off, but not because all of a sudden that's where the sale comes in. And so here at this very beginning, we create rapport, right? Um, and that's, that's highly important is it create rapport because people do business with people they feel connected to. People do business with people they feel connected to. So by the way, I can go anywhere in the world because number one, one of my, um, my self beliefs that I have is that wherever I am in the world is I'm home, right? I'm home. Um, so if I die here, I died home. I'm, I'm, I love that. And because of that mindset is I instantly immerse myself in the culture. And when I, I walk around, um, like I said, long before I get there, I already start doing research on the company, a country and, and a company, the rest of those things. Um, so here you create rapport. And rapport, what rapport creates is here connection. Remember, people do business with people they feel connected to. So um, I'm going to put some markers on here so you can see it. So here's Okay, so here's rapport creates connection. And then and then what connection creates is trust. It should be higher up, sorry, it shouldn't be on the down, it should be like here. But anyways, it creates trust. And remember, you gotta get the person to trust you. And, you know, if we're going to go in thinking, um, uh, you know, all oh, of these are Asian people and, you know, they're all, or these are Jewish people and they're all sharks and they're, you know, well, if you're not, it's going to read on you that that's your self-belief about people. Um, by the way, there's a lot of poor Jewish people. There's nobody ever talks about them because it sure ruins that story that all rich people got money. Um, by the way, my mom was Jewish and I used to be homeless. So where does that one play out, right? So the thing is, anyways, um, trust. Then here is where we got to introduce, you know, and by the way, in the rapport, we want to find out, you know, what do they want? Because people do business with, um, they buy what they want, not what you think they need. And if you don't find out what they need, or what they want, rather, you're probably trying to sell them what you think they want what they need. Let me repeat that again, because I just screwed it myself. If you don't find out what they want, you're probably gonna to try to sell them what they need. And they don't buy what they need. Nobody needs cigarettes, um, but they buy them anyways, right? So people buy, by the way, that one statement that a coach of mine um, uh, that I was I paid like $100,000 for, um, you know, he said that in our very first coaching call, made me over a million dollars that year. Um, people don't quit trying to sell people what you think they need. Sell them what they want because they buy what they want. So how do you find out what they want? Ask them. But three rapport, you'll find out what they want. And and this is by the way, you can do this in any country in the world. It doesn't matter because people are people. This part of us makes us who we are. And by the way, if you look at a um, a, a Chinese movie, Japanese movie, Arabic movie, Indian movie, whatever, Bollywood movie, you know, this is going to be in there. Elvis movie, boy meets girl, boy dates girl, boy breaks up a girl, boy and girl get back together. Happy ending. You know, it's, I'm sorry, I'm in an Elvis movie. Um, so, so anyways, it's in everything. So here is where we introduce the problem. We talk about the problem because Pain is one of our best motivators to do take action. You know, uh, um, you know, coronavirus. Uh, it's funny how people are juicing now and meditating and doing yoga and you know, um, working on themselves. All of a sudden, thinking about creating wealth. You know, um, there's all kinds of things when they had all the opportunity to do it for some pain kicked them in the butt. Um, you know, I'm creating a cookbook right now on 50 ways to serve your favorite toilet paper because everybody seems to want that so bad. I might have. Anyways, uh, you know, I really need a filter system. But then here is, you know, serving that problem. 
And then here is the call to action. But the sale happens here because in the connection, people will buy from people they feel connected to. And so I'll give you an example of this, Yasmin. I mean, I'm, I know, I'm, like I said, I knew your question would stimulate a lot for me, is, uh, as it always does. So I'm taking you on the road with me. Um, when I, I, I do a lot of corporate seminars and speaking engagements, and you go in and the, um, uh, the boss, whoever that is, CEO, managing director, you know, says, hey, Kirk, um, you know, we're looking at a, a bunch of other speakers. We're not sure um, who we're going to go with or what direction we're going with right now. We're just kind of seeing who's out there and whatever. And so I say, uh, that's awesome. And, um, but long before we even got to that part, uh, if when I, I don't wear them anymore, but when I used to wear a suit and tie, if I walked in and the boss was already, already wearing a shirt and tie, well, I would just casually take my jacket off and put it on the back of my chair because me out dressing the guy, you know, doesn't fit very well. So, you know, if he sees me sitting across from him and I look like him, where he, I, he's wearing a shirt and tie, I'm wearing a shirt and tie. Um, and, you know, if he's, uh, and by the way, in NLP, this would be called pacing and leading. It's very, you know, but we do it naturally anyways. I'm just trying to give you a, a term to it. Um, so I'm connecting with the person, but also as you just have normal conversation with them. I, I work on being interested, not interesting, right? Is, you know, be interested. Uh, I had lunch with, uh, um, of all people, um, Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger um, in Beverly Hills. And I got to tell you, Arnold is the most connective human being I've ever met in my life. Unbelievable how that man is more interested in you than he, telling you his story and, and who he is and what he's done. Um, and he's genuine about it. And that's the off-putting part. I mean, in a wonderful way. It's unbelievable how genuine and authentic that man is, um, considering number one bodybuilder in the world, one of the biggest movie stars ever, and the governor of the seventh largest economy in the world called California. That's pretty amazing, you know. As you see, it still sticks in my head um, on how connective he was. So when I'm in this corporate environment, when I finally get to the business part of it, and, and I've created a good connection with the person, and and find out a little bit about them and ask them, you know, what else do you do? And, you know, but genuine, I'm, you know, just conversational. Um, here comes the magic question. So uh, I know you're looking at other speakers right now. So what would have to happen in order for you to know that I am the right guy for your program? I am the right guy for your program. And they would say, well, you know, we need this and I want that. And I, so now I literally pitch write down what they just said. I literally go down and address those things proactively, and I even use their language back on them so that they, again, it sounds like them talking to themselves. And so then I say, and so um, how does that feel to you? And they go, you know what? I don't think I need to see any other speakers. I just feel you're the right guy for the program. I go, I believe you're right. So as you see, there's the curve. The sale happened way back here, and uh, uh, my my first wife used to say, "Man, Kirk, nobody says no to you," and I go, that, "That's correct, but if they do, then that's just not my sale." So I say so I don't wear it. I don't feel bad about it because I know I, you know. And by the way, a lot of people that I, I um, connect with that I even don't do business with, I become friends with, acquaintances with. They, you know, they called me later on, um, all kinds of different things like that. So it doesn't matter where you go, but if you're going to go into another country, learn about the other country and immerse yourself. Also is, you know, find some people, if you can, from that country. Um, you know, like funny thing is before I came to Australia, I had friends in L.A. who, I, and now I think about this, quite unique, is that every once a month we used to go to the Australian consulate for his drinks and nibblies thing they used to have. Um, and so I met a lot of Aussies there and I really fell in love with the country long before I got here. Um, but you know, it's funny is I learned parts about the country that most people wouldn't know. Like when I first came to Australia, I actually called it Brisbane instead of Brisbane, like a dumb American. Right. Um, so, and, and it was funny, people would say to me, man, you know, you pronounce it right. Most Americans say Brisbane. 
And, uh, and I thought, yeah, okay, well, I'm not most Americans, you know, so. Um, so with that is find out about the country, find out some, you know, unique cultural things, uh, connect with the person, with Yasmin, you know, look, in your job is working on the airlines, you know, you got to do this with strangers all day long, up and down the aisles, you know, and you guys do it magically. And I know you personally, um, you do it magically anyways, is just be you. Don't try to be somebody that you're not. By the way, if you're not a great salesperson, which 99% of people aren't, then don't try to sell. You know, be passionate and genuine and authentic about whatever it is that you are um, promoting to people so that people get your essence, not your sales pitch. So real quickly, and then I'll, I'll open it up again for questions. And um, by the way, I don't run out of content, so we might be here a while. Um, uh, the, the best company in the world, well, the best bed in the world is called the Wenatex. Uh, Wernicke Natural Textiles is the name of the company. It was created in Austria about 50 years ago. Um, I happen to know uh, Michael Wernicke, one of my best friends, and uh, his uncle started a company. And Mike, his dad, and his three brothers, um, uh, uh, two or two other brothers, I should say, um, uh, brought it to Australia. I was a raving fan since they first got here, uh, you know, that they started asking me to speak at their um, product launches and train some of their salespeople. And you know what? I could just go out and see the people who were selling the best, um, the beds. And by the way, it's, you know, it's anywhere from like a three to $12,000 bed. So it's, you know, and um, the, all the number one people who are selling all slept on the bed. People who weren't selling, weren't sleeping on the bed. I didn't even have to ask, but then I, I could, and I would know it right away. As soon as the people who weren't selling bought a bed for themselves and got the genuine experience of that bed, their sales dramatically went up because there was no sale anymore. It was them being authentic about what they're passionate about and they believe in. Does it make sense, Yasmin? I probably didn't even ask your, answer your question. I just babbled on for half an hour. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Joel, are you recording this? Great, great. So um, there's a, by the way, guys, I, that right there, that, that framework I just gave you, that is worth millions to you. If you, I would listen to that over and over and over again. And uh, again, I'm, I'm more than happy to get on more calls with you guys, you know, um, Joel and, uh, um, Christine and you know they have leverage on me. I think they you know they kidnapped my dog or something and threatened me if I don't get on more calls. I don't even have a dog, um, probably because they kidnapped him. But uh, the um, but that in it and you know there's a lot to it. What I mean is um, there's pieces in that you're going to have to work on. Uh, you know I saw an interview with Stallone just recently and they were. They were talking about something. He said, you know, the toughest thing to do in acting is play yourself. Because when you do that, you're making an attempt at being who you think you are, which is different than you're just natural doing it, right? Um, so it's the same thing as when you get into these places, you got to practice literally just being yourself and, and not worrying if um, people, you know, you got to zit or that. Um, you trip on a word or you, you know, you, your flies undone or whatever, who cares? You know, I mean, um, be genuine and be authentic. Um, and by, by being that, you know, and I think it's been my calling card to success in business and as a speaker and certainly as a coach is people get, I'm a real guy, you know, they on stage, they see I'm a real guy. I'm not trying to be anybody. I'm not. And because of that, um, and originally speak, uh, Pro speakers, you go, you know, you're, you're going to land on your face. You know, you're not as polished and you have bad diction. And, you know, you, you say stuff that you shouldn't say and um, whatever. And I go, yeah, okay. Uh, corp I used to go into corporates and they go, can you take out your earring? I go, well, no. And they go, well, that's not very corporate. And I go, and I don't work here. Um, and I go, by the way, I'm going to teach your people that they can be whoever they want and still be great and successful. And they go, well, that's, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good angle. I like that. It's not like anybody 
he came away and he go, you know, his content sucked because he wore an earring. I'm just me. And that gent, but I've, but I went, by the way, I've worked at learning how to just let go of what other people are thinking about me so that I can just be genuinely me. And guess what? People will love that. As soon as you're not, you'll be off frequency. And we've all seen this in people before. You've even seen it yourself where you go to do a presentation and all of a sudden your voice changes and something in you changes and your confidence changes because, you know, here comes the asking for the money part. And it just changes. Um, my, my, what Joel uh, said is that I, I took um, the women's Australian beach volleyball team to win gold medals at the Sydney 2000 Olympics and uh, Nat Natalie Cook and Kerry Pothurst. And um, when I was on stage opening for Arnold Schwarzenegger in Sydney a couple years ago, and because of that, the promoters called up Nat and Kerry and booked them because they thought, man, what an action lineup if I can get the girls here as well as Keurig. And so um, I'm the only guy in this two-day program, besides Arnold, that is, that wasn't selling something. And these people are just flogging the audience, flogging the audience. But I wasn't. I actually sold more than everybody else did and I because I wasn't selling anything. And that's why I sold so much. Um, but the girls saw um, everybody, you know, walking, walking away with money out of the room, you know, kind of thing. And they, they realized they didn't have, so that night, because they were on the second day, um, they came up with this idea because they're all, they're in um, isogenics and they came, which is f fantastic, you know, but they came up with um, uh, a way to um, promote it to the audience at the end of their presentation now they did a five-star presentation it was amazing they were genuine they were authentic professional and then all of a sudden i heard a frequency shift in their voice and i said to my wife i said here comes this, some kind of sales pitch and she's like how do you know that and i go just watch and sure enough you could just watch it and they completely lost the audience and they were still nat and carrie there was just something different about them when you're authentic and genuine, you don't you don't have to do it. Be you know be genuine about your product. Be genuine and, and excited about the business. By the way, you don't have to be making money already in your business to be excited about the money you're going to be making in the business. And if somebody ever says, "Well, how much are you making?" I go, "Look, uh, do you want to look at how much I'm making right now, or what I'm going to tell you is I'm on my way to making a lot, right? I'm in here. I'm a I'm a guy who's going to." apply myself and make the money. Do you want to be in the ride with me making the money or you want to be the guy who comes up to me a few years later and go, I should have got on the ride with you instantly because I don't back down from people asking me how much, you know, I'm like moving forward. Uh, they go, yeah, I'm sorry, man, you know. Uh, but it's one of those questions that people, as soon as they get asked when they're kind of starting out in the business, it, it unravels everything after that because they're like, well, God, you know, Either I'm going to lie right now, which by the way, you do that, you're definitely done. Or you're going to change your frequency in that voice. It's going to change. And now they got you in a back foot. Don't back down. Be very proud of you. Just say, hey, you know what? I'm an entrepreneur. I'm starting my business. But as you see, I'm just starting out and I can conduct my business right now and move forward. Now, you want to be on a ride with me, move forward. Or you want to be with people who sit at the bar and complain about how you missed another shot in your life. By the way, I'm not asking you um, as a charity thing to join this business. I'm looking for people who are looking to want to be successful. And if that's not you, then don't waste my time anymore. Let's go. You're like, oh, okay, great. Now, by the way, years ago, um, back uh, 20 years ago, I was in a company called USANA. And I was the number one sign-up guy in the world my first year because I don't back down. Um, because I, I believed in the product. I believed in the business. Otherwise, I would have never done it. It was just something I wanted to do because Robert Kiyosaki, I had a conversation with him and I was asking him, uh, hey, Robert, uh, you know, you're talking about the cash flow quadrant. Oh, by the way, he wrote Rich Dad Porter, if you don't know who he is. And I said, but you're getting all these people to move towards business when they don't know how to do business. That's very irresponsible. He said, network marketing. And I said, I'm not interested in Amway. And he said, you're ignorant, which by the way means uneducated. He said, um, there's a lot of network marketing companies out there that are on Amway, but they, they have the product, 
They have the business model. You don't have to have stock. You don't have to have overhead. You don't have to have um, to staff. Um, you can do it part-time while you keep your job. All the trainings and systems are there. I'm like, well, that's actually a great idea. So I started researching companies and then I, I, I chose USANA in those days, um, became the number one signing guy in the world. Unfortunately, the company did some unscrupulous things where the number one money maker, uh, Rob Nixon, I believe his name was, uh, was pilfering people out of my business, other people's business. And I had him dead to rights because me, he ain't going to beat me when I figure out, I found his, his weak spot and he gave up his information, told the company and they wound up uh, saying, well, he's the number one money in the world. We don't rock the boat. And I said, Oh, I mean, bylaws don't apply to everybody. So they handed me my award. I walked off the stage and threw it in a garbage can and shut my business down. And then the whole business, literally, you sound it collapsed in Australia after that because it unraveled with a lot of other people. Um, but my point being is that it's business. I didn't sell vitamins. I didn't sell skincare. I was passionate about making money in the business. Um, I saw it was a great business model. Um, I, the same thing I just said to you is that I, I could say to those people, look, um, you don't need overhead. You don't need staff. All the trainings here, the systems are here. You can do it part time where you can do half an hour a day, you know, outside your job and build it up until pretty soon, man, you, don't, you can fire your boss. You can say goodbye or do both. But my point being is what would you do with an extra hundred bucks a month? What would you do with a hundred bucks? So you, instead of you know, promising the Mercedes with the license plate and you'll be leaning on the car for the magazine cover, is give them something they can bite into. You know, what would you do this month with an extra hundred bucks? And most people go, oh, hundred bucks? Pfft, that'd be a game changer for me. See what I mean? So, but by the way, I want to say it to everybody. There was a guy I presented to who owned seven hospitals, including the, um, the Mater Hospital in, uh, in Brisbane. And, um, Obviously, I didn't do the $50 pitch or $100 pitch with him. This guy owns seven hospitals. Um, we talked big time. See, I knew who I was talking to. And he signed up right on the spot. And I, can I said, sir, I just, because your buddy who I'm doing this pitch for, um, you know, didn't believe. I said, why wouldn't he? Because I'm a businessman. He goes, that's what I do is I look for business opportunities. Man, what you said to me, you presented as a business person in a business structure. You showed me how I'm going to get this done came up with the whole strategy for me, I'm in. Boom, knew who I was talking to, knew how to talk to him. How's that? That was amazing, Karik. And the questions are rolling in, mate. You got, you got, you got them fired up. Um, sensational. So um, what's the best way to help someone overcome fear of judgment? Yeah, well, uh, you know, the, my, my little thing for life is, you know, the, the part of my language, uh, ladies, is, uh, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence because there's more dog shit in it. Um, you know, there, there's more dog shit fertilizing it. There's no other way to say it than that. Um, part of my language. Uh, I'm not really a swearing guy, but the thing is, um, you know, everybody's looking at everybody thinking they're the calm, cool, collective one. They're the one who's got it all together. And you talk to those people and they thought it was you that was the cotton cool and collective one, right? So in life, we're all screwed up. Every one of us is screwed up. Every one of us has had something in life and childhood that we took wrong and hurt us and twisted us and made us do this and you know whatever, great. Since we're, we know we're all that way, why would I feel bad about other people going through the same stuff I'm going through? The only difference is successful people, we learn how to manage it and work on it right? We heal ourselves through self-love. But that doesn't matter. If you think I don't have things that go on in my life, that's not even close to accurate. I'm a real guy, you know? And, um, just because I was in a helicopter crash on a Chuck Norris movie where five of my friends died um, and my best friend died in my arms on fire, um, doesn't mean that after an incident like that, that I have a get out of jail free card where life's not going to have any more problems. That's not it. So when I... And when you rapport with people again, you'll realize that those people, you know, like, by the way, I've seen Stallone depressed. I've known Sly since I was 18 years old. Um, I've seen John Travolta, who's been a friend of mine since the early 80s, um, down and depressed and family dramas and whatever. 
Um, you know, I talked to, when I, I we had to meet and spend some time with President Clinton. Um, you know, he was telling me about how his, when his teenage daughter was sneaking out of the house. Um, and he sounded like any other dad. And I said, I'm doing the math. But sir, when your daughter was a teenager, weren't you president? And he goes, yeah. And I said, so how is she sneaking out of the house? He goes, that's teenagers. I go, what about Secret Service? She goes, that's teenagers. See, um, he's, he's a dad. Or like Stallone lost his son a couple of years ago. And Travolta, both of them, you know, sons, their sons died. He's a dad, man. Just because he's a movie star doesn't mean he's not a dad. And so they're people. And ev people from every walk of life that I've ever met are people. Uh, when I was coaching the top executive, the number one guy at Kuwaiti Petroleum, who, by the way, employs 97% of the entire country of Kuwait, the, they fly me auto to, the auto way to Kuwait from Australia, and the, the first thing he wants to work on is, um, secure, uh, I'd really like some strategies on how to get my grandchild to take a bath every night. Or a shower because oh my god I'm trying to get him to do that it's like a, you know i want to rip my hair out and i man you flew me all the way here for that but see head of a company uh my good friend ashton wood who comes he, he works at our retreats with us our find your fire retreat and a very good friend of mine um you know he's been working with the ceos of ford and jeep and um you know found out that man you know their job's not what you think it is the stress levels, the people coming with problems to them. So my point being is, um, you know, the, the, the way you stop is you stop judging those people. See, if you want to not be judged, lest you judge unless he wants to be judged. Stop judging them, that they got all their stuff together and that they got it all perfect. And that, they're, you, know, why, you know, they're looking at me judging me. See, that's you judging them. Because if you're thinking they're judging you, then they would be judgmental people. That's your judgment on them. So you got to stop judging them. <laughs> wow, outstanding. The, the gold nuggets uh, are coming through thick and fast, mate. Um, no, next question is from Sharon and Bronwyn. Sort of same sort of question. How do you sustain consistent daily improvement? What is your driver when you're not on your A game, when you've had a big day or you're tired? or have some other excuse get in the way, you know, talk rituals, mindset, consistency. That was the second part of the question. Sure. Well, well the, the, I, I would say the key to it all would be is, number one is first, um, be loving and kind to yourself. Like first, um, you know, take care of yourself through every day. Uh, you know, yes, there's gonna be some days kids in life, you know, uh, gotta be up or something. But the thing is, I, I'm not a, you know, and Joel knows me very well. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not a guy who teaches people to take massive action. I teach people to take effective action. And so, um, you know, I have my son, he's uh, eight. It took me 50 years to get ready to have kids. So, um, you know, it was my mom's dying word. She made me promise to have kids. Literally, the last conversation she had, and she closed her eyes, and that was it. Game over. And so two weeks later, I came home, got his mom pregnant. Just don't piss off mom. She would come back, slap you around another time. Um, but the thing is that I'm very loving to myself. And then the first thing I do in the morning is I have a ritual that starts off my day so that it does tune up my tank. Off, you know, don't, don't let the day beat you up. And then all of a sudden I'm going to, you know, I'm going to read my goals and do my affirmations. You've already taken the too big of a hit. Is you got to fill up your tank because every morning when you wake up, your tank's empty. You know, it's emptied out. By the way, that's what sleep's all about. Your body's, your brain's got to reconcile. It's got to relax and it's got to let stuff go. And your body needs a rest, but your spirit doesn't. That's why it goes out and dream. It dreams. Right? It's like, I'm going to go have an adventure. I'm boring, laying around doing nothing. But the body needs a rest. So get good sleep. And by the way, a great bed is critical for that. And, and no TV and, um, and uh, noise and white noise and all that garbage that, you know, gets the brain still functioning. Uh, and then, you know, so I get up and I read my goals. I read my, some affirmations that I have. Um, I have what's called my morning power questions. One of them being, what am I grateful for today? The first answer is always, I woke up today, right? Imagine how great you feel just by saying, yep, yeah, made it, winner. See, after that, the rest of the day is easy. 
is why I did the hardest thing. I woke up. Um, and, you know, what do I love more about my wife today than I did yesterday? Um, by the way, if you have a partner in life, that question will keep that relationship fueled and loved and all the rest of stuff because it evolves or dissolves one direction or the other. You keep growing it. Um, what do I love more about my kids today than I did yesterday? What do I love more about myself today than I did yesterday? See, because every issue we have in this lifetime is a self-love issue. And, you know, if you really love yourself more, would you allow yourself to be poor? That's not how love responds. Or would you love, uh, allow yourself to be fat or um, abuse drugs or alcohol or smoke cigarettes? That's not how love would want you to be. Love would want you to have everything. Why don't you be happy and want everybody else to be happy? So I treat myself very lovingly. Um, I quit criticizing myself. Instead, I acknowledge myself for everything I'm doing approximately right. And then I celebrate it all. And that's my like theme song, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Is, you know, and by the way, you got to be outward. It's not a rah-rah thing. What it is, it's training your brain that this feels good, which then it automatically wants to do more of it. But if you're just going to keep working away, your brain's going, there's no end to this. And you lied to me. You told me entrepreneurship is for creating a lifestyle. It's not. It's just you saying you don't have a job, but you're working harder than you've ever worked. Matter of fact, you're working so hard that if you were an employee, the boss would go to jail for treating you the, you know, the way you're treating yourself, right? So what you have to do is you got to treat yourself lovingly. So I get up and um, I exercise and I meditate. And, um, you know, so I start off the day very peacefully and feeling great, but I, you know, do some exercise. Then, um, uh, Aaron and I, my wife, we have uh, a strategic team meeting every Monday. And it's uh, first thing in, in early in the day, like 9 o'clock or whatever. Um, and so in that meeting, you know, we discuss, now why would a husband and wife have a strategic team meeting when you live with each other? Well, because this is you um, first in today's environment, the coronavirus and all that stuff. Man, you want to talk about feeling because our business is being challenged like everybody else's it's a, you know it's a worldwide thing going on right now so it keeps us focused forward we are excited and inspired because we're working on something we're working on changing the condition of that our business is in we're not just sitting there being a victim we set goals we come up with effective actions that we're both going to take that week to achieve the outcomes um, and then if the meeting goes, like if it's scheduled for three hours and we finish in two hours, then that last hour is to start taking effective action right now. Well, every time we take one and we're sitting across the table from each other, we celebrate. That's ah, awesome. Sold one audio book today, you know, or one, you know, my wife's got a new program called um, Happiness Online. You know, I think it's like $19 or something, you know, yeah, another $19 sale. See, because if you can't be grateful for a $19 sale, you won't be grateful for a $19,000 sale. You know, it's all the same stuff. So we keep ourselves tuned up by keep reinstalling the celebration, 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 because it trains your brain, just like dog does a trick, give him a treat. Dog does a trick, give him a treat. Well, of course the dog wants to do the trick again. He knows he's going to get a treat. Treat yourself the same way, and you'll automatically want to move forward. Easy. And by the way, the payments, the, the payment is instant because you keep feeling good, which is, by the way, that's why we're entrepreneurs. It's not to make money. It's to create a lifestyle. So create the lifestyle and the money will come with, because your brain goes, man, I love the lifestyle I'm having. I'm going to keep it. So how do I do that? Oh, got to make the money and it will find a way. And then people go, because there's that thing again, is people don't buy your products, your service, your ideas. They buy the way they feel about your product or service idea, so they're buying you. And see, when people come to me, they go, I don't know what the hell you sell, I just want it, I want that. They wanna feel like you. And man, if they think it's Juice Plus, you know, and they're going, man, if that, if that works, if that gets you like this, I want that. So that's why you gotta tune yourself up every day, because otherwise, if you're saying, look, you're gonna you stay in my life, I don't have time, I got kids, I got business. Well, that's like saying I'm so busy flying my plane, I don't have time to put fuel in it you do that you crash right same thing life you're gonna crash you got to put the fuel on every day and I do it every day and you can see about by the way I've been doing what I do for 40 years now 40 plus years now I'm scared to say that I freaked myself out 
I'll go to retirement home after this. Um, but the thing is, you notice I'm still very passionate about it. And that's because um, it's a formula. It's not my formula. It's the formula that when you apply the formula, um, it is a guarantee that you will be successful. Now, I'm, you know, you guys are getting a framework for it tonight. That's why and through coaching people and through my life success club and things like that is, you know, my coaching of people, um, I just work with them on installing those pieces of the formula and then learning it so they master it on those levels. But then you're on your own because now you, you, it's part of your habit. And that's the other key that I was going to talk about is all of this stuff needs to be made into a habit because when it's a habit, it's easy to do because you don't even have to think about it anymore. It's just who you are because that's your habit to do it. And how do you do that? Install it with passion and enthusiasm for like 30 consecutive days playing full out and actual malts who wrote the book psycho cybernetics in 1950 said if you do something for 28 consecutive days with passion and enthusiasm it becomes a habit wow another great answer thank you Kirik. uh i'm seeing the comments in here like this is awesome thank you like uh, so helpful by the way that's my short answer so no we, <laughs> we we didn't put you on here for short answers Kirik. so it's all good i don't know if uh, i have but anyway. <laughs> yeah um okay so wow this is this is could be a long answer as well who has come into your life that really inspired uh or changed your life uh well i would say the number one person his name is elijah joseph ashley that is my son he is the most influential person that's ever been in my life he's changed me more than anything else um and uh including where you know here he was like um uh, three and a half years old four years old and uh, you know being a dad you know you can get that tone in your voice when you're not happy about something i, I mean he never hit him never threatened never call him a name you know none of that stuff and so one day when he's like three and a half four he says you know dad i i really don't appreciate that tone and um you know you always say that i'm intelligent and if you just treat me like that and tell me, I'll actually do it. Uh, okay, well, there you go. Checkmate. So my point being is that the, you know, the power of love is the most influential thing ever. You know, my dad, my hero, you know, I'm my, my, my dad's only child. My mom raised seven. She was, she was a lot more friendly. Um, my dad uh, was, a, you know, he taught me integrity. And he always taught me that when you sign your name to do a job, whether you get paid for it or not, you go and do the job as if it's the highest paying job you've ever done. And you give it your all because you never leave a place where somebody talks bad about you. You always leave a place where they're asking you back. And my dad, when I used to work for him on his, you know, hundred million dollar construction sites that he was the boss of back in those days, you know, when I, when I came on board as a laborer, my dad said, uh, by the way, there's no nepotiz nepotism on this job. You're here to make me look good. And any day that you're not making me look good, you don't have a job any longer. And my dad was dead serious. But he taught me that work ethic, you know. Um, and the last person I think I, I, I owe a lot of credit to is a man named John Hersfeld. And uh, John Hersfeld is a, a cat, um, Emmy Award winning, Directors Guild, Directors of Choice winning, a uh, screenwriter and movie director who, uh, by the way, was roommates with a guy named Sylvester Stallone in college. Um, and they're still to this day best friends. And that, that's through John that uh, I, I get to be, um, know Sly so well and be friends with him. But John, when I was 18 years old, uh, I met him at a health club that I was working at in Los Angeles in those days and literally became my Mr. Miyagi and, uh, um, you know, forced me to read every day out of books and checked on me what every day would call me up in the studio what page you on and i mean like and if i told if i made something up man he knew it right away and was in my face he made me look up two vocabulary words every day and write them down in a book that i had to carry in my pocket a little notebook and then he would call me up in the studio and go peruse using the sentence uh, i was perusing the map and i found peoria illinois and he goes very good and hang up on me so he really forced me to educate myself. And the first book he made me read was a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And um, he called me up every day to ask me what page I was on and what was happening in the book. And, and then it was Herman Hesse with Siddhartha 
and uh, Narcissus and Goldman, and then it was Norman Vincent Peale, and it went on and on. And John still to this day is one of my very, very, very best friends. Um, but man, that guy, he, he took, a, uh, took me under his wing, taught me movie making, but taught me about life and taught me about how I show up in the game. Um, and uh, I, I owe him a lot. So there you go. Well, thank you, Kirk. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, yeah, I like if you've read uh, Howard Love respond, uh, that that answer was um, was super awesome. That that was obviously written before Elijah came along as well. It, yes. Well, the book is now. Um, uh, well, by the way, April eighth. It was eleven years uh, that it's been out, and we just literally this week relaunched the audio version of it because uh, I got the rights back from the publishers who had it ten years. And then they wanted to charge me $30,000 for the audio file of me reading my own book. And they said, I can read it again. <laughs> so we went to the recording studio and re-recorded it way better than the first time. Because, you know, you can remember is I know my content that much better and I'm much more seasoned at it, um, including the recording process. And so uh, we just released it, uh, literally went out this week and sales are going through the roof already. I'm very honored because it's, it's my interpretation of what I wrote, you know, which is the number one best international bestseller. I'm very proud to say, um, but people get so much more out of the audio version of it because it's me with what I wanted to write. And so I'm very um, insistent on, um, on how I read it all. So in the studio, I'm kind of like a little biatch, uh, you know, uh, um, what do you call those? Uh, um, a diva, you know, when it comes to making sure that um, it's, I get the take that I want on it. So it sounds authentic. Brilliant. So where would, where would, um, where would you find that? Kirikashley.com? Yeah, it'd be on Kirikashley.com or send uh, Aaron an email, which is easy. Ask, A-S-K, at Kirikashley.com. Um, and she can help you with that. Uh, also is, um, you know, if you go to my website, Kirikashley.com and, we have a free 10 day online course called get out of your bad mood. It's about managing how you think and feel, which is critical to being successful. It's the key ingredients, key distinction between successful people and average people. It's free. And then because of that, you'll get on our mailing list and, and Aaron send you information on. So there's many ways. I'm easy to get a hold of. For yeah. Kirk will actually answer you if you message him. <laughs> if you write me, I write back. Amazing. So I got, um, Okay, so want to know the name of the bed? That's Winnetex. Winnetex. Yeah, and I got one last question. Hmm. It's it's just a quick one. <laughs> Biggest and most profound life lesson to date, and why and how? Gee whiz. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, uh, again, pardon my language. Um, I was doing a, a program in Long Beach, California, years ago. And it was early on in my career. My mom happened to be in the audience there. It was all for 65 to 85 year old women. And um, it was this big, like 350 women who once a month get together to have lunch with each other, but also bring on a, a speaker and learn something and whatever. And so I'm on stage, I'm really passionate and uh, I'm really caught up. And by the way, like I said, I'm not really a swearing guy. And I said, sometimes in life, you just got to say, what the fuck? And you got to go for it. You got to kick in the gear. And then I'm like, oh, my God, I did. I hope I did not just say that. And as I looked out in the audience, I realized I had just said that. And so I said, look, ladies, I'm very, very sorry. I did not mean to use that language. You know, my mom, I did not tell them how do you speak that way. And I'm like, thanks, mom, you know. And so one woman raises her hand and I'm trying to avoid, you know, the confrontation of you know, getting chewed out and whatever, but I, I got to deal with it. So I said, yes, ma'am, I apologize. You know, and she was, Hey, you need to let me speak. Right. Don't interrupt me. And I said, Oh yes, ma'am. I get it. And she said, you know, I'm 85 years old. And for a lot of you women in the audience, you know, you're 60, 65, you're young to me. You know, um, if I was your age, I'd have a lot of life sitting in front of me right now. So, you know what I just learned today? It's what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? Why don't I use my best China every day? Like, what, what the fuck? 
Like, why don't I eat off my best china every day? Why don't I use my best cologne every day? And why aren't I just having fun every day? What the fuck? So I want all, I want to hear all you ladies in the audience say it right now, what the fuck? What the fuck? And they're literally the whole audience is cheering it on. Um, and I, I go, man, if any time you could have a video camera, this is when you can't you couldn't replay the stuff. Um, but you know what? I learned from giving in that moment through receiving the same thing. And by the way, you know, you got to remember 25, well, that would have been about, I take that back, that would have been about 30 years ago now, uh, maybe longer than that, is uh, every day I wake up, I'm born. And every night when I go to bed, I die. So it's always about what am I going to do with my life today? This is it. If I get today, I'm putting it all in today. And I'm living it to the fullest. So that if it's over today, which by the way is, you know, coronavirus, terrorist attack, shark attack, heart attack, Death is death. The rest is just the story of how it happened. Um, you know, car accident, whatever, you know. By the way, my wife's husband died 35 years old in the Sunshine Coast Plaza up here in the mall of nothing at 35 years old. Just dropped dead, having a conversation with him. Had the three and a half month old Sasha on his chest in a harness and luckily rolled on the way down and then killed his daughter. Um, he died of nothing. They can't find any reason, autopsies and tests. So you don't have to reason, but live your life today. Instead of living it just as another day in your life, live your life as if your entire life is in this day. And man, you know, so I wake up every day with, um, because it's my first day and my last day, um, is that I have uh, awe and wonder and I have gratitude and appreciation. And I live every day like that. Wow. <laughs> That was amazing. I can't wait to watch this again, Kerry. You've done well, mate, as usual. So, the sense you're going to have to beep, 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 part of this uh, conversation. But anyways, I trust it's a nighttime call, so we only have adults on the call. So. That's okay. It's all good. <laughs> we'll we'll uh, do the radio edit version maybe one day. doesn't matter. <laughs> so, Kerry, uh, look, you're getting such great uh, comments in here. I'm not going to read them all. It's just that... You know, people are messaging me even privately saying, this guy is absolute gold. So I guess they're the new ones that you haven't met before. <laughs> but, um, Craig, okay. if you know me, you definitely want to be writing nice stuff about me. Not kidding. <laughs> we're going to, look, we're going to take you up on your offer to come back. We're going to get you back in, you know, we'll talk about that off camera and get you back. And uh, right. look, guys, go wild in the chat. Uh, if you want Kirk back. Tell him, like, show him your appreciation and listen, go go to kurukashi.com and, and check out his book or, you know, like it's, it, it changed my life. It's changed my family's life. Anyone that I recommend it to comes back and tells me how much, how awesome it is. So, you know, <laughs> Thank you. believe me, trust me, it's right. I'm right. <laughs> anyway. I'm writing, I'm writing the second one right now, which is called The, um, the, the Mystical Mentor. And I'm very excited about it. It's a, it's a more of a story though, but it's um, very, very exciting. I'm going to, I'm going to keep messaging you and asking you how. Hey, I like going. that. Oh, I like that. Um, you know, Erin's working on her book right now and I'm, so we keep holding each other accountable with it. I've been working uh, for a little while trying to get that first chapter in my head where I can start to see it. Cause then the rest of the story flows and I found there and how I want to tell the story because that there's many versions of many, um, ways you can tell a story and so you have to choose a way so that's not all over the place that it's it has the curve sensational all right well thank you Kirk. 